great. Uh, good afternoon, good morning, good evening, depending on where you are in the world. Uh, I'm happy to be here with you today to talk about how redesigning city streets can be one of the first steps towards creating a solar punk world. I want to start by recognizing that the land where I live and work in Philadelphia stands on the indigenous territory known as the Lenape Hoking, the traditional homelands of the, of the Lenape, also called the Lene Lenape or Delaware Indians. And the area that I've highlighted in red on this map, which was produced in the 1930s by the WPA, is called Shakamaxon, which was the capital of the Lenape Hoking. And this actually relates to my topic today. As we can see in this map, many of the trails of the Lenape Hoking converge at Shakamaxon, which was the site of the 1682 signing of the so-called Friendship Treaty between the Lenape and William Penn that would pave the way for the settlement of Philadelphia and Pennsylvania. Today, a park called Penn Treaty Park sits on the site of Shakamaxon, and this park is one of the main green spaces in my neighborhood of Fish, called Fishtown in Philadelphia. The trail that I've highlighted in red here developed into what is today known as Frankfurt Avenue and is one of the main commercial corridors through my neighborhood. I point this out to make the point that there's an amazing durability to the infrastructure of our cities. Streets are the primary structural unit of the city. They allow us to communicate and to move about. They constitute the order within the collective whole. Streets are complex institutions with great social, political, and economic depth. There are some streets and really old cities that are thousands of years old. This is an image of Straight Street in Damascus, Syria, which has followed the same path for about 4,000 years. It's mentioned in the Bible. Streets, once they're built, stay with us for a really long time. But just because their paths remain the same, doesn't mean that their character can't change. Since the advent of the automobile, we've actually come to a point where we tend to think of streets as something that you just drive on. But giving them over to single functions like this depletes them of their historical role as the public right-of-way and connective tissues of all cities. Now, I mentioned that the complex logic of streets has become simplified to a more or less single use since the advent of the automobile. I wanna expand upon this quickly with a little more history. This is a view of Broadway in New York City from 1875. We can see that it's more or less chaos. There are pedestrians, private carriages, commercial vehicles, and more, all sharing the space and navigating it with very little conflict. And this is made possible by the fact that none of them are moving particularly quickly. Then we come to the 1920s, which were a disastrous decade for human-scaled cities. In the early 1920s, the idea of jaywalking was invented by the automobile industry. And by 1924, the word had entered the dictionary and it was deemed illegal in most American cities. The result was that cars would finally supplant pedestrians as the primary users of streets. And so by 1925, streets in Manhattan looked something like this dominated by motor vehicles with pedestrians pushed to the sides. In 1928, we see the founding of CM, the International Congress of Modern Architects, by the French architect Le Corbusier and others, which would promote the rationalization of cities as machines. And this approach to urbanism is epitomized by Le Corbusier's Plan Voisson, which we see here, which infamously called for raising a large part of central Paris and replacing it with cruciform office towers and snaking mid-rise residential blocks. Finally, 1929 sees the completion of Radburn, New Jersey, which aimed to create a garden city in which pedestrians were segregated from vehicular traffic, but which also gave us the functional categorization of streets as local streets, collectors, arterials, and freeways resulting in streets being thought primarily as means for moving vehicles from one place to another as quickly as possible. And this categorization is now encoded into virtually every land subdivision regulation in the United States, and even in many places around the world. Now, you've probably all seen this brilliant illustration by the Swedish artist Carl Jilg. And by depicting the streets as canyons, it shows just how much space we've ceded to automobiles. 
And this, of course, is a problem because cities should be for people, not for cars. And with all that being said, I think streets are actually one of the most important places to begin returning cities to the people and working to create an urban solar punk society. Because as suggested by the French philosopher Henri Lefebvre, revolutionary events generally take place in the street. We of course seen this throughout history and especially over the past several years and the massive protests in support of Black Lives Matter, reproductive rights, climate justice and countless other popular movements. And if we look at the proto solar punk novel, The Fifth Sacred Thing by Starhawk, we see that the rebellion of 2028 in the story actually began when the four old women who sparked the rebellion began digging up a street. Quote, they tore up the pavement blow by blow and filled the holes with compost and planted them with seeds. So with that as a starting point, I want to look at a few examples of how streets are described in proto-solar punk and solar punk literature. And so as we just saw, the rebellion in the fifth sacred thing began by reclaiming the street for the people. The city of St San Francisco is described by Starhawk is depicted in this beautiful piece of art by Jessica Pearlstein, which we've probably all seen, which is probably my favorite depiction of a solar punk city. And the book describes San Francisco in th this short quote. The city was a mosaic of jewel-like colors set in green, veined by streams and dotted with gleaming ponds and pools. Seen from above, Blocks of old row houses defined streets that no longer existed. Instead, bicycles and electric carts and the occasional horse moved through a labyrinth of narrow walkways that snaked and twined through the green. Starhawk's version of San Francisco is a city powered by renewable energy with streets reclaimed for gardens and a mix of mass transit, as well as bicycles, small electric vehicles and horses. And in her description of San Francisco, Starhawk is at least referencing, if not altogether borrowing, from the world created by Ernest Kallenbach in his book Ecotopia from 18 years earlier, in which some of the streets have been replaced by creeks, and no one worries about potholes because they are filled with flowers, which you may have seen has become a popular form of protest against the disrepair of streets over the past few years and I would suggest is an incredible form of solar punk action that we can all take. The Cities of Light collection, published by Arizona State University's Center for Science and the Imagination in 2021, includes a short story by Paolo Bacigalupi called Efficiency, in which he describes how the south side of Chicago has been remade, as we hear in this short excerpt. James, was just old enough that he could remember when streets had been for cars. Now, more than half his neighborhood street was dominated by solar panels and home gardens with only a thin lane for the hood zips to navigate through. In summer, the reclaimed street was full of vegetables and flowers and buzzing bees and people sitting on benches beneath the shade of high mount solar panels. Another story from the same collection by Deji Brysolokotan is set in what he calls an energy sovereign community in San Antonio, Texas, the entrance to which is described here. Quote, the air felt cooler here as if a layer of heat had been pulled away like a lemon rind. Looking towards where the street should have continued, he noticed that it ended abruptly and had been converted into gardens with a wide central path. Finally, a third story from the same collection, this one by a Andrew Dana Hudson, describes its Portland setting in which, quote, quote, there were hardly streets at all, just bikes and scooters zipping along greenway paths, buses sliding through hedge-lined tunnels, light rail linking together bustling mixed-use plazas. Now, what is common to all of these descriptions? Personal cars are entirely, or at least almost entirely, eliminated in favor of gardens, spaces for gathering, and more. Mobility has shifted to mass transit, to micro-mobility options like e-bikes and e-scooters, and to human-powered options like bikes and simply walking. This is important because we have to realize that innovations like ride-sharing, electric vehicles, and autonomous vehicles 
may all be useful tools of tr transition, but they can't be the final goal because they don't solve the problem that was so brilliantly illustrated by Carl Jung. Cars have been given too much space in our cities. So with that as a kind of introduction, I wanna quickly lay out a series of six interrelated principles for solar punk streets, and then give some practical examples as to how we can work towards them. The first and most important thing to note is that solar punk streets are child friendly. If we make streets and cities friendly for children, pretty much everything will take care of itself. As Dr. Leah Karsten states, quote, the public space of the street used to be a child space, but it is transformed into an adult space. And this has resulted in what Karsten calls indoor children and a backseat generation that is chauffeured around the city by their parents. Creating streets that are safe for children as both pedestrians and cyclists gives them back the freedom to roam safely, to be what has been called free range children decreasing social isolation, and improving both physical and mental health. I personally saw this a few months ago when I took my family to Paris earlier this year. Our hotel was located just off the Rue Claire, a pedestrian priority market street. And the street was so safe that we were able to let our daughters, who were seven and nine at the time, to walk to the patisserie by themselves each morning to pick up breakfast. And this boosted their confidence and gave them a great feeling of freedom to start each day. And it also gave my wife and I a bit more time to get ready for the day. Paris has made the pedestrian safety of children a priority through their school streets program, which aims to give kids safe paths to walk to school and closes streets directly adjacent to schools to allow the schools to use them as outdoor classrooms and play spaces. And in Philadelphia, we have the Play Streets program, which closes neighborhood streets in each summer, especially in disadvantaged neighborhoods, and provides free lunches for any kids that want them. Now, the second principle, solar punk streets are accessible, and this is really closely related to the first one. The first impediment to accessible streets is the curb. Things like curb cuts, areas of refuge, and especially raised crosswalks, which also slow traffic, are important tools for increasing accessibility, but they're also really the bare minimum that we should be doing. Some places are doing away with curbs altogether, creating shared streets that the Dutch call woonerfs that give pedestrians priority over cars. And also in Philadelphia, my friend Nate Hommel, who's the Director of Design and Planning for the University City District in Philadelphia, designed these tree seats to provide additional seating in an area where most benches have been removed to prevent their use by people experiencing homelessness. And these benches had the unintended consequence of making the city more accessible for the neighborhood's elderly residents by allowing them to walk longer distances because they actually had places to stop and rest. Now, oftentimes people will counter the call for better pedestrian and cycling infrastructure by saying, well, what about people with mobility differences? How are they going to get anywhere without access to a car and easy parking? But inclusive infrastructure like wide protected bike lanes can actually increase the mobility of people with physical impairments. Ableist thinking often assumes that people with mobility differences will have access to motor vehicles, particularly access to adapted motor vehicles. But given the high cost of these vehicles, that's often not the case. But in the Netherlands, 16% of trips made by people with physical impairments are actually pedal powered. And the Dutch also provide subsidies for mobility devices for those that need them, which like the scoot mobile seen here on the left can be used in cycling lanes too. Building on these two previous principles, solar punk streets build gender equity. By creating cities, that increase the independence and mobility of children, the elderly, and those with physical impairments, we also create cities that have more gender equity. And this is largely due to the fact that care work is predominantly done by women. When children are more able to move about the city by themselves, their parents are no longer burdened by ferrying their children around to various activities. And therefore their parents, especially women, 
will have large chunks of their days freed up for other pursuits. Mass transit planning also has significant gender biases. Transit is usually planned around providing the highest levels of service during, quote, peak hours. But the question is, however, who's peak? When we prioritize service for the morning and evening rush hours that bookend the traditional nine to five workday, we decrease service in the middle of the day when most trips related to care work, whether being performed by parents or hired help, are being done. This also further marginalizes low wage shift workers and service industry workers, making commuting via mass transit far less convenient and thus more expensive for those least able to afford it. The fourth principle is that solar punk streets are quiet. As Doug Gordon points out, it's important to remember that cities aren't loud, cars are loud. One of the first things that people noticed during the early days of the COVID pandemic was just how much quieter cities were. And this was largely the result of the drastic decrease in vehicular traffic. Noise is actually the pollutant that impacts the largest number of people around the world on a daily basis. And decreasing speed from 30 miles per hour to 20 miles per hour can lower traffic noise by about six decibels, which in the way that we perceive sound cuts noise in half. A quieter city allows us to be more in touch with nature hearing bird song and other sounds of nature rather than the noise of cars. A quieter city also enables people to make more use of the passive cooling effects of simply opening up their windows, therefore reducing the reliance on HV HVAC systems for cooling buildings. The fifth principle is that solar punk streets are healthy. This de decrease in speed that I just spoke about has the added benefit of making streets much safer. In car versus pedestrian collisions, the pedestrian survives 90% of the time at 20 miles per hour, but only 20% of the time at 40 miles per hour. And this, of course, has significant impacts on the safety of streets for pedestrians and especially children. One of the nearly universal aspects of the great streets of the world is that they're lined by street trees. And this has countless positive effects on the urban environment, many of which have both direct and indirect consequences for the health of urban dwellers. The shade provided by street trees can reduce the temperature of sidewalks between 20 and 45 degrees Fahrenheit. The evapotranspiration from trees reduces adjacent air temperatures between 2 and 9 degrees Fahrenheit. And with the rising temperatures resulting from climate change, this can literally mean the difference between life and death. Research has also shown that simply seeing a tree can decrease our heart rate and feelings of anxiety. Similarly, better streets encourage the time-honored tradition of stoop sitting, which helps develop a sense of community amongst neighbors. And this decreases crime as a result of the eyes on the street but also decreases social isolation, which has a positive impact on mental health. Finally, and perhaps most obviously, solar punk streets increase climate resilience. Many cities now have green streets programs that encourage the integration of stormwater gardens into the, de into the design of streets. And the main point of these gardens is, of course, to mitigate flooding during large rainstorms but they also serve to decrease the urban heat island effect, to increase biodiversity, to absorb CO2 and particulates, and they're just beautiful to look at. The greening of our streets can also be incorporated into our mass transit infrastructure, which can decrease the noise from trams by 10% and lower the temperature of the rails by 50%, creating a smoother ride. And of course, we all know that anything we can do to lower the amount of fossil fuels being burned for transportation is a good thing. As we see in this graphic by the Institute for Sensible Transport in Australia, the shift to electric cars only offers marginal improvements over a fossil fuel car when powered by our existing grid. But shifting to mass transit and micro mobility options offer massive savings in CO2 emissions. So, how do we start? 
I would argue that an incremental approach is one of our most important tools in starting to implement some of these changes. Getting rid of cars and decreasing parking are not popular ideas, especially in the United States. The transition is going to be uncomfortable, and the longer we wait, the more uncomfortable it will be. So the last thing I want to do is quickly show a few examples of how to start transitioning our streets from spaces dominated by cars back to spaces for people. One of the most famous examples of incrementalism in urban design is the pedestrianization of central Copenhagen, which between 1962 and 1996 expanded from a single street to an entire network of streets and public squares given back to pedestrians. They slowly removed between two and 3% of the parking spots in the center of the city each year, gradually reclaiming space from the automobile and reclaiming their public squares for people rather than parking. Parking day is another example of incrementalism. It began in 2005 when the San Francisco based arts collaborative called Rebar converted a single metered parking space into a temporary public park, as we see here, utilizing, as they said, the short term lease afforded by the parking meter. Parking day has since become a kind of global phenomenon with participants in hundreds of cities across six continents. Then in 2010, the success of parking day begat the first parklet, also in San Francisco and also designed by Rebar, as we see here. And once again, these have proliferated around the world. Finally, these have evolved into what have been called streeteries, which of course proliferated during the COVID pandemic and have become permanent additions to many cities around the world. Another example of this type of approach is the so-called snack down, which combines the words snow and neck down, which are also called curb extensions. These began several years ago when my friend John Geating, who's also the president of our neighborhood association, began documenting these pockets of snow on streets that aren't being driven through. And with these photos as evidence, he was successful in getting the city's streets department to provide pedestrian improvements, like the small pedestrian islands seen here. These ideas have now been used in several neighborhoods throughout Philadelphia to make incremental changes. Here, the University City District in West Philly was able to use paint, planters, and stone barricades to create curb extensions that drastically decrease the crossing distance for pedestrians. The New York City Department of Transportation has used this incremental approach on pedestrianization projects throughout the city, most famously in the pedestrianization of Times Square, which began as a two-year pilot project. In the first year, they simply closed off the streets with barricades and put out a bunch of cheap lawn chairs because the nice furniture that they had ordered didn't arrive in time. The project ended up being incredibly popular and successful and eventually evolved into a full redesign of Times Square by the architecture firm Snowheta. Taking Times Square and Broadway from a space for cars to a space for people. Now, one of the key takeaways from the pedestrianization projects in New York City is the marriage of these kind of bottom up or guerrilla tactics with the top down planning process, similar to the idea of dual power that Andre discussed earlier today. And this combination of top down and bottom up is one of the is an important part of the last project I want to share with you, which is called Street Moves Sweden. Uh, which is being administered by the Swedish Center for Architecture and Design and the Swedish Agency for Innovation Systems. And the idea is to give residents the opportunity to play a role in the design of their streets on a block by block basis across the entire country through a series of workshops and consultations, which empowers neighbors to determine how much of the street area of their block will be dedicated to cars and how much will be used for other public uses. This is similar in many ways to the better block ideas that Andrew spoke about this morning, but made permanent. The designers have developed a modular kit of parts, including seating, gardens, uh, bicycle and e-scooter storage and more that can be installed in the street. So piece by piece, they can transform the street into a social space. And the interventions can also be changed over time as needs evolve. 
The project has already been implemented at four sites in Stockholm and is being expanded into other cities with the hope that it will eventually expand to reconsider every street in the country. So in closing, when we talk about these sorts of ideas, urban designers often hear things like, that's nice, but we're not the Netherlands, or that might work in Copenhagen, but it'll never work here. But people in Copenhagen said the same thing back in the 60s. The thing is, these places that we think of as bicycle paradises and incredibly humane cities weren't always that way. They made the same mistakes in the 50s and 60s as most other places around the world. But more recently, they've made the decision to, and have spent the political capital on making their cities better places, better places for people, and in turn, better places for the environment. So as Tony Cade Bambara says, our job is to, quote, make the revolution irresistible through stories, artwork, and concrete actions that create visions of the decarbonized future that are so compelling to be as to be irresistible. Visions like this project by the architecture firm WATG, which reimagines Fleet Street in London, and the amazing series of short films called Visual, Visual Utopias by Jan Kamensky, which reimagines streets around the world, or perhaps even some of the work being done by my urban design students, which reintroduce nature to the city in, produ in productive ways. Projects that I hope are compelling in irresistible ways, and that hopefully will help to bring about a solar punk future. So I'll close with my favorite quote from Arundhati Roy. What lies ahead, she asks, reimagining the world, only that. Thank you.